listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps aspiring professionals in film get where they're going faster by dissecting the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives in the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley. Bonjour, mon ami. It's Valerie Jane Parker. I am an actress, a uh, redhead, and an all-around bubbly, magical thinker. Uh, you might know me as Judy on Greenleaf. Oh, we hate Judy. Also as Sweet Claire in The Last Summer on Netflix or Angie on Nashville. And upcoming, I have a few feature films. One of them is Voices, which I'm extremely proud of. It deals with the issues of blindness and disability, as well as a small role in the upcoming Wrong Turn franchise that's being rebooted, and a feature film called No Time to Run. Valerie Jane Parker, welcome to the Make It Podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for being here. I am so excited to have this conversation with you. I think that um, you are a true success story, and you've really been doing this your entire life. Uh, you got your first theatrical role at six years old, according to your bio. That's true. <laughs> um, I'm curious what that role was. And, and I'm also wondering, did you know at that point that you wanted to act or, or was that something that you were sort of foisted into as a, as a child from, I, from maybe your parents? Sure. Yeah. I did grow up in a theater family. So my whole family grew up, you know, doing theater was who we were. That said, I've always known that I was meant to be, an actor. There's a lot of things that I love doing. There's a lot of things that I'm blessed to say I'm talented in, but there's never been another thing that was my passion, the way acting has been. And it's just always felt like this is who I am. Um, that role at age six, I am very proud to tell you, was the leading role of Mrs. Claus in our school's Christmas pageant. It was a pretty <laughs> cool Santa was gone. Mrs. Claus had to save the day. And I beat out third and fourth graders as in first grade for that role. So, I mean, I don't want to brag, but <laughs> OG back in the day. <laughs> my, my, it might have been meant to be, uh, you know, you beat out the older kids at that. <laughs> I was like, step aside. I'm marrying Santa. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And it's funny. I, I think my very first role uh, I ever had. Uh, and I'm not an actor, but <laughs> I did a lot of plays in my life. I think I played Peter Pan yeah, <laughs> at one point, and I my mother made the outfit out of felt, <laughs> so it's like wow. a giant felt outfit. And then, in a true turn of irony, uh, someone had me play Andrew Jackson. <laughs> 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 Now, when this podcast comes out, can you find a photo of you as Peter Pan and Andrew Jackson and attach them to the images going out with this podcast? Because that would make my heart so happy. I, I know for sure I can find the one of me as Peter Pan. I think <laughs> I think to save me, I, there no one took pictures of me as Andrew Jackson. And um, I, I literally think they cast me because I wouldn't ever comb my hair. So it was always big and poofy like Andrew Jackson, I guess. That oh, was, man, that's too good. Oh, man, if I could find one of those pictures of someone out there went to Cole Elementary and you got a picture of me as Andrew Jackson, please send it our way. Yeah. Um, Make my day. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, it, there's a big gap there. You know, you you did that at six, but then you went on to play Juliet in, in a performance of Romeo and Juliet at age 15. Mm -hmm. That that's a big, heavy role. Yeah. Um what what do you think made you prepared for that kind of role at age 15? I was a very serious child. Um, <laughs> no, I loved, uh, I loved reading as a kid. And so I've never been a serious person. Um, I was a, a very serious reader. I got really into like heavy adult books, as weird as that sounds. I loved Charles Dickens back in fifth grade. Um, Jane Austen, all that stuff. And so naturally being an actor, I fell into Shakespeare mm -hmm. and I thought, Oh, I'm going to be a Shakespearean actor. That's what I'm going to do. And Romeo and Juliet was my favorite because I mean, 
preteen girl who's not who's not going to love Romeo and Juliet. And I just knew that that was going to be my dream role. So I had probably been preparing to play her since at least I was uh, nine, 10 years old. <laughs> um, yeah. That, so I was jumping at the bit to do some Shakespeare by the time I was 15. <laughs> yeah. And you mentioned that that was serious and that, and that, you know, it was sort of a more challenging role. It's, there's a lot that would go into it. I would imagine mm -hmm. f from a preparation standpoint. And when you meet a lot of kids that want to be actors, they only see the uh, fame part of it, the performance part of it. They don't see the behind the scenes work of it. Was there anything in that process you fell in love with that, that the behind the scenes, the part that no one sees the grind yeah, I'm very blessed that um, the fame part of acting actually scares the bejesus out of me. That's never been something that I've been attracted to. Um, to me, the fun and the joy of it is the crime. It is the work. It's the hours of prep that goes into reading materials and creating the world and understanding what the playwright or the screenwriter was going for at the time, understanding their world, if it's a historical piece, um, then getting to spend the hours and the labor of love, building that reality for yourself that you get to share with the audience. That to me is the joy the, the process is the fun. Yeah. 100%. And I think that if you can love that part, then you, you'll, you'll have no problem sort of taking on, the, the challenge of the job as a career. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's any secret that, that your parents uh, are both pastors by trade. <laughs> um, and they, but they all, they both had, you know, these, this sort of, uh, and have this uh, tilt towards entertainment. I mean, your dad uh -huh. plays guitar and writes screenplays and poetry and stories and, and does those things. And, it's always been, you know, performance has always been at the forefront. Um, I happen to, to know your brother Isaac used to be in a band called Helms Deep, and I've actually seen him perform live. And it's yep. now that's a that's a pullback right there. That's, oh, no, you went you went that, way back in the day. Yeah, that's a deep cut. A <laughs> yeah, it is. But but I, <laughs> but so I'm curious how that faith and how, how your faith supported or, or has guided your creative path in television and film and, and what role does, does faith play if any at all in your approach to acting? Um, faith definitely plays a role in my approach to acting mostly because faith plays such a role in my approach to life. So I wouldn't really know how to separate out the two. Um, whenever I take on a role or a character, it's very, um, very intuitive based. And I would call that intuition God, but other people, you know, would say it's going from the gut. Um, I, I pray a lot over the things that I do and, um, put a lot of intention behind them and then just go with whatever I feel like my gut's telling me. Like if it's a decision on a character, okay, we're making that. Or if it's a role I shouldn't take or should take. And I just kind of, I'm constantly shooting from the hip and letting fate just lead, lead my life. I'm super blessed by the parents that I grew up with. Normally when you hear of an actor having, um, pastor parents, that's like a recipe for disaster, but my folks are <laughs> weird. I always describe it as I'm like, well, it's like a couple of hippies decided like that they wanted to fall in love with Jesus and stop smoking pot. <laughs> and like, right. that, would be, that would be my parents. My dad is actually a theater major. Um, and he has a theater company in Smyrna. They were just cool, cool people. Although, I'm not going to lie. It's a, it's a strange balance um, when you're an actor and there's nothing more terrifying than calling your pastor dad and being like, Oh, Hey dad, FYI, I might have to do my first sex scene. Like things like right. that are, yeah, they're a lot of fun. To <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I can imagine that would be uh, a little awkward. I think yeah, it's awkward for anybody. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no matter what the background is. Uh, speaking of your dad, he, he said that his favorite memory of you is uh, in Anne of Green Gables. What? How old were you when you played Anne of Green Gables, and why do you think that was one of his favorite roles for you? Um, I was I was seventeen when I played that role, and I think that that was one of his favorites because he played Matthew in the show, which is like the 
grandfather character, but that's kind of like a dad to her. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only other times we've acted on stage together, let's see, have been Shakespeare. And um, once was in Romeo and Juliet. He did play my dad in that, so he had to beat me. And then we also <laughs> did, uh, like, and then we also did a performance of Oh Midsummer Night's Dream, in which, and this is beyond screwed up, um, in which he was the king and I was the queen. So we were married. So of course that's going to be his favorite memory of sharing a stage with me because he didn't beat me and he wasn't married to his daughter. <laughs> <laughs> He's already winning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did not, I did not expect that answer. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, I will never be married to my dad again. I don't care if there's nothing romantic. It's gross. It's disgusting. <laughs> that's the best. That's the best. You, you are, um, you, your acting and, and your performances sort of live in two distinct lanes. Uh, you've mm-hmm. gotten several dramatic roles, uh, and you've had several comedic roles as well. Uh, <laughs> I think people that would see you in Greenleaf would say you're, you're very dramatic, and then mm-hmm. you were somewhat comedic in your role in in, in Nashville, and then uh, in the in the short Love Gwen was extremely dramatic. So I'm curious. You know, which roles do you find uh, more difficult or challenging, dramatic or, or comedic, and why? Huh. Um, which, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I like difficult and challenging. So, um, I, Kali, I don't know that I would, I would probably say the dramatic roles are more difficult and more challenging but that's part of the fun. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I just like switching it up. I always like doing the opposite of whatever I just did. So that's what I tend to look for in a role. If I've just done something really dramatic, I do like to be funny and like to break it up um, and do a comedy role. And if I've just done sweet comedic characters, then I like going really heavy. That's the fun for me is constantly trying to find a new challenge. Yeah. And you, um, uh, well, I should I should sort of amend to that question and, and ask, which one is more naturally you? Are you a funnier person or a more dramatic person naturally? I am um, in a conversation with me. You would definitely say that I'm naturally a more funny person. I've gone through extremely um, intense things in my life that lean into me being able to be very good at the dramatic roles. And so I like both because they are both a part of me. And I think that they're both an honest part of the human experience. I think a lot of times people get so caught up in the hard things they've been through in life and that defines them and it becomes who they are and they lose a lot of their lightness. And I feel like on the flip side, a lot of us try to run from the hard things that we've been through and we feel like we have to be all comedy in life. I think life is both. And so am I. (laughs) You mentioned earlier, just a few moments ago, that uh, faith guides you a little bit on, maybe a lot of it, on what roles you should take and not take. Uh But I'm curious, beyond that, when you get offered a role, what are the considerations that you have um, on whether or not you'll take a role? Are there any red flags you look for? Anything that stands out that you could uh, pass on to this audience? Uh, I always like to read the script first. If they won't share the script, that's a huge red flag. And I would say that for any upcoming actors, if there is a role and it sounds great, but they are being very secretive with details at all, run, run for the hills. Um, because there's a reason people Mm. aren't secretive for, (laughs) for no reason. And it's not normally because the script is so precious that they don't want to release it to you. If they want you bad enough, they'll let you read it. Um, it's normally because there's something they're trying to hide from you. Um, so that would be a huge red flag, but no, in general, it's just, um, it's a feeling of whether or not I connect to the character partially, but more like if I am in line with liking the message of the story, um, at the end of the day, is this something I would want to watch? Is this a, a message that I, a story I feel like is worth telling that deserves an audience? Yeah. And it's so difficult to judge that with clear eyes. Mm -hmm. It's so hard. You talk to people who take roles and then regret it later, but at the time they, they really thought it was going to be great. And it might've just been also that they simply just needed to work. 
Oh yeah. And that's a huge thing. And there's no shame in that. There's no shame in taking a role because you need to work. I would warn someone against taking a role out of pride. I feel like that's where we get in trouble is sometimes you get offered a role as an actor and you kind of like the script. You kind of don't, you're not really sure where it is, but it's a large role and think all these great things like, Oh, this could do X, Y, and Z for my career. And this could launch me here and there. Whenever it's your pride talking, I feel like that's when you should, uh, check yourself and just make sure that, that you're on the right track. Those are the ones that tend to get us in trouble way more so than being like, yeah, that was a lame lifetime movie. And I got tased in the butt and died, but <laughs> hey, I that. Well, yes, that has happened to me. And you can find that movie. <laughs> What's the name of that movie? <laughs> uh, they've actually changed the name of this movie three times, by the way. Um, I'd have to look it up now. I think it's, it was called Homecoming Revenge at some point, but I think they have changed the name since then. It really has changed titles over and over again. I think depending on the country is released in, but yeah. Right. We'll, have to check, <laughs> we'll have to check that out. Um, one of the most intimidating things for, for actors is, is going into an audition and winning, especially when it's a competitive role and curious what your advice is or what your approach toward auditions is that, that you can share. I love auditions. Um, never, ever look at getting the role as winning would definitely be my advice. I think whatever you do that, you are just setting yourself up, up to fail. Because even if you get the role, the win is based on someone else. It is nothing you can control. And at the end of the day, you might have gotten that role because you were the most talented person in the room. You might have gotten that role because two other people turned it down and you didn't know about that. You might have gotten that role because you were the only blonde and they hate redheads. I mean, you never know <laughs> why you got it. So the way that I handle auditions is I like to feel, I feel like I'm a success if I've left an audition and I feel really proud of the work I've put forth. Um, because whether or not I match their vision for the character or whether or not they're going to use me for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. And that's totally out of my hands. I can't control that. The only thing I can control is my performance. And so if I leave and I'm like, man, that was okay. All right. Then I, I feel medium about that. If I leave an audition and I feel like I know I gave my best work, then no matter what happens, I'm happy because that's all I can do is put my best work out at the end of the day. I can't control the outcome. I can only control me. Um, so I take it out of their hands, man. Right. <laughs> But it's a healthy thing to do. I think whenever you're basing your success on someone else's metric for you, you're going to fail because you can't, you can't control that. You can only control your own, how you feel about your work at the end of the day. What are the two best pieces of advice you've received so far in your career and who gave them to you? Who, who did they come from? Um, hmm. Gosh, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to think about that. Um, can we circle back to that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And we can actually sort of maybe ask a proxy question to that, which is if you could provide an actor with one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, is this like an up and coming actor or? Why don't we do both? Yeah. Someone who is aspiring and, and just getting started then maybe someone who's a vet like yourself? Honestly, my best piece of advice would probably be for both what I just said, which is never base your success off of what someone else tells you off of what you see on paper, because that can change all the time. If you're putting out work and characters that you are proud of, then that is what success is. And that's where your happiness should be in a character. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I think that's, Great advice. You, every actor has someone that is their uh, visual muse, if you will. I'm curious, what creatives do you most admire and want to emulate? And what do they do from a technical or skill standpoint that makes their work stand apart? Well, I love Baz Luhrmann. I have since back in the day. And I love him because even though critics aren't a big fan, I think he's a genius. Because what he does is he takes pop culture and he takes basically what we would consider the lowest form of art that everybody can get on and then in the masses and he creates high art out of it and i love the way he merges the two i think moulin rouge is brilliant i think the get down is brilliant i just i love how he can take 
all these silly pop references and elevate them so that people who aren't moviegoers and who aren't necessarily high artists can get it. And I think that's why critics don't like him because he makes things accessible. And I think that's great. <laughs> um, so he's always been a big, a big influence of mine. Um, who else? There's so many. I mean, we're so blessed to be in a time with so many great visual artists. It's just oh, exciting. <laughs> Is there any actor that, that you, that inspired you when you were um, getting started that you said, okay, that's the style of acting. I, I, you know, I appreciate, or I think I can master myself. Oh yeah. When I was growing up, I thought I was going to be Nicole Kidman meets Catherine Hepburn. I thought I was going to be this <laughs> real serious, dramatic actress. And that was, that was exactly what I wanted to be. I didn't, when I was younger, I thought that only dramas were, were really what was important. I thought like if you were a dramatic actor, that showed that you were super talented and, you could go the distance. The older I get, the more I realize that people need joy and not uh, being able to bring funny to things and bring life and levity to things is possibly an even higher gift than being able to uh, tell a dramatic story because <laughs> people need, people need the lightness. I love yeah. that. I love that. You know, no state has given more in, entertainment rebates than the state of Georgia. Mm-hmm. And in many ways, the industry is, has moved to the South, but still a lot of the energy and planning and um, idea structure really comes out of LA. And we've seen mm-hmm. a lot of our contemporaries in Atlanta and in Nashville and the surrounding area move to LA. Um, I know you have a, have, have sort of deep roots here in the South, but, what is um what has prevented you from moving to LA? Um, life. Every time I've been supposed to move to LA, something crazy's happened that's kept me here. So I was looking at moving to LA around this time last year, well not last year, uh, two years ago. Um I was living in Atlanta at the time and I was like, all right, it's time, it's time to go out to LA. Um, the reason I didn't originally start my career in LA, I'll backtrack a little bit is because I had friends who all graduated college, moved to LA, New York. And I realized that getting your foot in the door out there when you have zero credits, (laughs) it's like a one in a million shot. And even though not much was shot in the Southeast at the time, I realized that what was shot here was a much smaller pool and I had a much better chance of getting those initial couple credits. So I thought, okay. I'll get a couple credits under my belt out here and then I'll move to LA. Um, and then the industry took off in Atlanta, ended up moving to Atlanta instead, decided to move out to LA, finally take the leap a couple years ago. And my mom got diagnosed with cancer. Um, so I actually, instead of moving to LA, moved back to Nashville. I was like, okay, I'm going to spend all my time with my mom and take care of her. And then I was going to move out to LA again uh, in January of 2020. I ended up switching managers and they were like, Hey, you know what? You can take a month or two with your move out here. So I was like, okay, cool. I'll move in March of 2020. And as we now all know, that's when the COVID pandemic hit. And so I still have ended up moving, but I'm really grateful because I would have been quarantined in LA all by myself instead of out here in Nashville with my garden um, and my family. So much better. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have that in common. Um, I think both of our mothers died um, young mm-hmm. uh, in, in probably both of our opinions. My mom was just about 61. Um, oh, al- age. Okay. Yeah, almost, almost past. I know your mother was, was 64. Um, how did she, you know, you've, you've talked about her as your soulmate and your best yeah. friend. And I'm, I'm curious, how does she support you? in in this career. And, um, if uh, she were with you today, what advice would she be giving you? She was my, Oh, she is my biggest cheerleader, like bar none. Every single time I wanted to quit or I didn't feel like I was enough, like nothing like my mom. She's always been so, so, so supportive. And speaking of those hard conversations with the pastor parent, I remember the first one of those I ever had was with her. And it was a role that I was looking at taking that the movie ended up being a disaster. And so I I turned it down, but not because of this, but the role 
um, the character was a lesbian and there were some um, sexual scenes in it. And I was like, okay. And I remember talking to her about it, thinking that she would be like, well, I'm disappointed with you, but go ahead and take it, you know, if you want. And she just looks me in the face and she goes, baby, your dad and I always knew one day you'd be a lesbian. <laughs> I mean, I yeah, oh, so great. Uh, <laughs> I supported me bar none on everything, but she always, always believed in me. She and I know her spirit still does. Um, anytime I was nervous or about to freak out on stuff, she could she could talk me down. And in fact, even though she gets very embarrassed, maybe bringing this up, the only other person who has the same effect on me um, has been that kind of support for me is my agent, Cookie McRae. And I've told her before, I said, Cookie, I think part of why my mom like felt like she could pass was because she knew you were here looking after me the way she would. Um, Cookie is like a mom to me. She is an amazing, amazing woman. But Margaret Meek, man, she's protective. She loved me and she always believed in me. Um, that woman is spectacular. Yeah, and it sounds like she really was. And um, I may have met her about 20, maybe 25 years ago. Uh, but I wish I had more interactions with her. And, and of course I love cookie friend of the podcast and friend of friend of mine. There's really uh, no one quite like cookie oh, man. And, and to just explain <laughs> her and say, hey, she's like a mom to me. It almost isn't enough because she's, um, <laughs> she is that. And then she's, she's, uh, so, so much more. And then she's almost like, um, an indigo child, those indigo children that, mm -hmm. that uh, you hear about, read about where she's really in tuned, uh, into who you are and, and what is hurting you. And, and, and yeah, she's, she's, she can touch in really easily into, um, she's sensitive to those things. She has a yeah. sensitivity to, um, to, to whether you're happy or sad or why you're happy or why you're sad or why you're excited or what you're up to. And, um, it's truly a gift. So shout out to cookie McCrane <laughs> and, and certainly shout out to Margaret Meek as, <laughs> as well. Now they call it uh, being an empath. I, I do the same thing. It's when you can feel people's energies and cookie is very, very empathic. Um, you just, I mean, just a few minutes in the room and she'll pick up on, on anything. Yeah. <laughs> you said that so much more succinctly than I did. Uh, that, <laughs> that is perfect. That is exactly right. Um, you have a tremendous repertoire when it comes to the voices and your dialects you can do. You've done a lot of voiceover work. Um, you can do Australian, British Cockney, Liverpool, uh, Canadian, Eastern European, French, German, Irish, Italian, I Yiddish. Like child who used to love to be with <laughs> <laughs> and then I found these interesting Minnesota New York uh, New Zealand oh, yeah. South Africa and, and of course you were you were born in Zimbabwe but um and, and southern U.S. so how did you how did you pick up all these voices and you know what is the process of developing these voices it sounds like it'd be very hard to just sort of pick out Minnesotan dialect, for example. So I'd love for you to talk to us about, about that. And if you want to do one of the voices, feel free. <laughs> um, so I just, I have a good ear for it. Um, the secret for me is figuring out the vowel sounds. Once you know how they pronounce their vowels, you can do anything. Uh, but the way I lock into being able to do a particular dialect is I can this is going to sound strange. I normally will think of a sentence um, in, in that voice um, that I can hear in my head in that particular accent. And once I repeat that sentence to myself, then I can say anything with mm. that voice. I know that sounds strange, but that's always kind of been how it goes. Some of them come more naturally than others. I think part of it was growing up in sort of a weirdo household, we watched a lot of foreign films. So I heard a lot of different voices and with my folks being missionaries so early on and all their missionary friends then coming to stay with us as I was growing up, I just heard a lot of, a lot of different, a lot of different voices, but I think it's just, I don't know, naturally been there. When I was a nerdy kid back in high school from 14 to 16, I worked at a Chick-fil-A. Super cool. I know. <laughs> um, and I used to do the drive through there 
And I would always do it in different action plans. So when people were picking up their food, um, it was so fun. So one day I'd be Australian, the next day I'd be French, I'd do this and that. And it was a blast to just like try to convince all the customers that I was switch out name tags and they would get called later and be like, uh, yeah, this little, this little Aussie girl was, uh, working the drive through and, uh, she didn't give me the Polynesian sauce. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mike. I, I got it for you. Know. Anyway, that was, that was what I did for fun in high school. So that was real cool. I think that's proof that you're just a natural creative. I, I'm, you know, I wonder if your parents ever rolled you out to do impressions for all those people that would come by the house. Yes. All the time. And I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I had a job, Valerie, yes. at Blockbuster Video when oh, I was a teenager. Wow. And video, Blockbuster Video, interesting. That, that's right. And what people don't, pe- most people don't know what happens at Blockbuster Video between 8 a.m. and let's say 4 p.m. Okay. Uh, because most people will come in at night. It's it's an interesting business. You know, you got really your flood of business between 4 p.m. and and midnight which is when you could rent a movie and, and do all that stuff. But the store was open at 8 a.m., 9 a.m. ish, and would be open, you know, all morning. And those were the shifts I would work. And so what happens in the morning at Blockbuster Video, Valerie, if you don't know, is that you're calling all the people who have either stolen movies or are late in returning the movie. Okay. Uh, okay. And this is my job to go sort of retrieve the film. And I think what's funny about this is that if, if you had lost a movie uh, and this is sort of 1990s dollars, late nineties, uh, you, you would cost you $130 for the VHS tape. Like <laughs> if, you, if you didn't have it, you know, we charge you $130. And I would always, it was, it was such a monotonous job, Valerie, that I would start to do voices. I would do yeah. like, um, <laughs> I would do similar to what you did at Chick-fil-A. I would, I would have different voices I would use to just sort of approach the call differently and see what happens. And one of my favorite things to do was to be a sexy R and B radio guy. Oh my gosh. Yes. And what I would do is I would start in this voice that I'm in now. And then I would start to slow it down a little bit. And I'd say, Oh, we really, I know you have the video at your house and I really, really need you to bring it in. And I would, I would, it would get like that. And what, what was fascinating about it, Valerie, is that people would lower their voice to match my voice. Yes, they do. <laughs> so the lower I got, the lower they get. And eventually it'd be like, I'm going to bring you the movie. I am. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to bring it to you soon. And it was, <laughs> It, it made the job tolerable. It was it was fun. I did all sorts of voices like that. And um, and what's funny is I found out later, after I was um, fired, that they have all that stuff on video. So somewhere out there, there's video of me doing those voices at the counter and some executives laughing at me at some point. But um, yeah, that's that's what creatives do, don't they? Yes, I wish that this was um, on camera right now because I wish you could have seen my face while you were doing that. That brought me. <laughs> So much joy. You have no idea. That was amazing. Amazing. Oh my goodness. I'm an idiot. Uh, no, so. I love it. But you're right. People do match the energy. And I think that just goes to show we're all looking for like something a little bit weird in our day and something a little bit fun. Like people want that. They, they want that call yeah. from, the, from the sexy R&B guy. Uh, I, <laughs> video instead of just, Hey, your movie's overdue. Bring back sex in the city. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. After, after about 20 of those phone calls, you got to switch it up and do something oh, different. Love it. Um, we mentioned earlier, you have a feature film coming up named voices. I'm really excited for this. And you play Lily, uh, who is blind. And so that is new and challenging. How did you prepare to play a role as a blind person? And then have you thought about, or, or was it a consideration in your preparation to, to think that maybe a blind person could actually listen to this film and how would you perform it that way? Uh, it's so interesting that you asked that. Um, and those are, I'll actually address the second half of the question first, um, because the way we filmed this movie is a little bit revolutionary in which they actually 
filmed it so that the script is written very descriptively. Um, mm. And they filmed it with a blind audience in mind. So there are intentional pauses written in the script for any time that they would need to have voiceover come on to explain what's going on. Um, but then they also have the characters naturally speak in a very descriptive way so that someone who is blind can watch the movie with very little interruptions. So generally when a blind person watches film or television, the way it goes for them is you would have say like, um, you're watching friends. So it'd be a normal episode of friends. They're saying the dialogue at any time something happens that would need to be explained visually. Literally it's paused. There is no music in the background and someone comes on and says, now Joey picks up his coffee cup. And then it unpauses and you go back to the laugh track and the lines and then it immediately pauses again. So it's very interruptive. It's not cohesive for them to listen to and enjoy a normal movie or television show. This film was actually created so that it's a really cohesive experience so that there's very little explanation that needs to be done. But the beats are also built into the actual script and the soundtrack so that there is no harsh pausing whenever um, they're listening to it for anything to be explained. So that was actually something that the uh, filmmakers did. That was their original vision was to make a movie that both a blind person and someone who wasn't visually impaired could watch at the same time and enjoy Um, and props to them. That was revolutionary and really, really cool. (laughs) And that's, and that's Nathaniel Nguyen. Yes. Yeah. And you should interview him. He's a genius. They do really cool things. They also do, um, in addition to being a screenwriter and a great filmmaker, uh, they do VR. So they have these virtual reality video games. They've done VR for, um, the Mandalorian. They do it for different brands. Like they do the coolest, the coolest stuff. These guys are a really interesting artist, um, just around the board. I really, really enjoy them. That's awesome. And then from, from your preparation standpoint, how did you prepare to, to play Lily? Oh, so many things. Um, I, when I prepared to play, I prepared to play Lily from two different perspectives. Um, Preparing to play a blind person would be one half of that. However, I feel like if all I did was prep the blindness, then that would be not doing justice to her beautiful spirit. So there was also a lot of work that just went into building this wonderful, inspirational character. Um, When it comes to the blind aspect of her, I watched documentaries on blindness. I watched a lot of YouTube interviews with different people who would explain going about their day, what their experience had been like with blind person, read a few books written by people who had lost their sight and basically what you go through in the mental process of that and what you overcome. Um, I have a friend named Bobby Holland. Shout out Bobby. Um, I know Bobby. Oh, you know Bobby? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Bobby and I met Bobby is um, legally blind and we talked um, a couple times about his process. And he showed me some really great practical things. Like, um, I had already been using my cane. I bought a cane on Amazon and I've been practicing with it for about a month when Bobby and I first met, but he taught me how he uses his and just like little things that you wouldn't think of such as he's like, Oh, when I go out to a restaurant, I never put my cane on the floor because I'm going to pick it up with my hands later. It's dirty. I put it under my legs, stuff like that, that I wouldn't have thought of. It's just practical. Um, Bobby and I went through. And so he was extremely, extremely helpful, but we would go walking with our canes around. He's a music producer around his studio, going up and down the stairs and doing this and that. Um, and then in my day to day life, after I'd had my cane for a couple weeks, I would go out and practice walking with it. I would wear my big sunglasses, um, and would try not to focus my eyes in on anything. Although obviously I am not blind and can't walk around completely blinded. I would sometimes wear (laughs) blind glasses. Maybe I did that hiking once or twice (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, because I knew I'd be alone. I knew the hiking trails well. And honestly, it's a really different experience when you experience the world without your vision. And it's, I don't want to sound full of crap, but it's actually really beautiful. Um, you learn to listen so much more. It's an amazing thing when you're out in public and you're not using your eyes 
you still hear when cars are coming by because you're listening to them. You know when people are approaching from far away because you can hear the different ways that they walk. And I can tell if it's a woman or a man. I can smell their perfume. I can hear the little kid laughing. You feel their energies. It's a crazy, crazy thing how even without literally losing my sight, how those other senses were heightened. And it was really beautiful. And it taught me to be a much more observant human being and a much better listener um, from my experiences playing a blind person. It was very, very cool. That's fascinating. That is, it's, you have those heightened senses because uh, you're missing one. So those other senses really have to go into overdrive. And it's amazing when you can just that detail of knowing whether it's a man or a woman coming towards you uh, is um, that's really incredible. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. You have, you have some things coming up. You've got wrong turn, the foundation uh, yeah. you've got voices, of course, as we talked about, and we have no time to run. We've got no time. Sorry. I, I love saying that. <laughs> no time to run. No, no time to run. Uh, so do you have a sense of when these things will come out of post-production and be available to, to watch? Yes. Um, Voices was supposed to be coming out next month here in theaters. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19 and the theater still being closed, they are holding it here. I just found out this week. Um, until next year, which stinks, but Hey, it'll be okay. It'll either be released in January or they're going to hold it for the following October, which is my guess what they're going to do because it is a horror film and we love our horror films in the fall. Um, it is coming out overseas, um, in a month. So that'll be cool. Uh, no time to run post is finished on. And I know that they're hoping to release it very soon. I haven't gotten an actual date. Same with no, uh, same with wrong turn. The foundation post is finished on distro is finished on it's been sold. And I know that they're hoping to have it out next month. So we'll see a lot to look forward to from you, Valerie. And uh, I'm excited to to see how these all turn out. Just a few more questions. If if you're still okay on time. Yeah. Awesome. What, um, what are the biggest creative and business mistakes you see newcomers making? Oh, gosh. Um, So whenever you start out as a, as an artist and a creative person with talent, I think so often we want our talent recognized so bad. And we're like, oh, I can do that. I should have this role and this role and this role because you know that you have the chops for it. However, um, man, the struggle is what defines this industry. And I think the biggest mistake we make starting out as any kind of an artist is feeling like you should be successful right off the bat because number one, it doesn't work that way. (laughs) There's so much more that goes into this than just talent. It's building relationships. It's learning. It's, it's every, everything. Um, but I also feel like whenever your talent is recognized early on and you get some of those early breaks, sometimes that's a curse instead of a gift because this is a very hard industry. And I think that those early struggles prepare you um, for the difficulty of this industry. And if you are too successful too soon, then I think it sets you up to really fail because you have to go through those struggles in order to know that you've got the chutzpah um, to, to really continue on in this industry. And I think so often kids want it so bad because they see that they have the talent, but they don't want to do the struggle and they don't want to do the work. And that's what defines somebody who makes it or who doesn't. No one makes it in this without being willing to struggle for quite some time, quite frankly. Even people who have an inside track with money and family and this or that, it's still not easy for them. There are a million things that are difficult in this industry. um, And you've got to be an extremely hard worker. You've taken a lot of criticism uh, on the Mm -hmm. internet, uh, and I'm sure you're not alone in that. How how do you deal with it? How do you deal with people who are Mm -hmm. criticizing your performance or criticizing you as an individual or just flat out being mean? Yeah. Um, and, uh, for those of y'all listening who don't know what Chris is referring to is my character on Greenleaf, Judy. Um, woo. Everybody hates Judy. She was a bad guy, which is honestly, 
I, I didn't mind the, <clears throat> the criticism of Judy because if people hate her, Hey, that means I'm doing my job. That means I'm actually really good at it because I want you to hate her. You should hate her. She's not a good guy. Um, however, there are a lot of people who were extremely critical of my body and my physical appearance and who attacked me as a person from that role too. And when I first was being attacked in those ways and huh, there were, it happened for months and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments. Um, at first it bothered me some, but really at the end of the day, I was able to step back from it. And I realized all those people who were saying mean things about me, um, or about my body, especially no one says anything meaner on the internet or writes anything crueler than the things that they say to themselves in their own head at the end of the day. And it really kind of hurt my heart because I thought, sure, these people are attacking me, but they're doing it because at the, because they're not happy with themselves. Um, you don't say cruel things to strangers that you wouldn't say to yourself. We only, we love other people the way we love us. Um, and so I realized the reason why people were being so mean to me was not because they really hated me, but because they were unhappy. Um, and that gave me a different perspective on it. It actually made me reach out to those people who, um, had said such cruel things and just share my story with them because I thought they need to see me as a human. They need to know who I am. Um, and I just wish that we were all kinder with ourselves. Um, I don't know if that made a lot of sense, but <laughs> that's, I don't know. When people talk about me, I realize it's not really about me. It's really them dealing with unhappiness about who they are and lashing out at somebody else. That, that's right. And it's and, and great feedback. And thank you so much for that. I, we have this thought and I think I was having a conversation about it even earlier this week, which is that the most cliche things are the best advice because everyone's repeated them so much. They become, you know, super cliche. Mm -hmm. And you might not get better advice in your life if you really think about it than the golden rule. Right. Yeah. As cliche as it is at this point, if you really practice the golden rule, you'll have a very happy life and you'll make other people happy around you. And I wish more people just followed that simple rule uh, out on the Internet and, and in life. Well, and it's um, like they say, in, uh, what is it? Perks of being a wallflower. We accept the love we think we deserve. I feel like when people are being cruel and hiding behind a keyboard, especially to do it, it's because at the end of the day, they are unhappy and they are sad and they are probably saying all these things to themselves secretly and they need another way to lash out and to do it. And it just, it breaks my heart for them and I want them to feel seen and loved. Like I don't, I don't hate anybody who hates me. Um, I don't want to put that out there. I want to, I want to hug them. <laughs> I just, I wish that everybody knew that they were loved and important. Yeah. And I think this conversation could help with that. There's something magical about winning over the heretic. And so <laughs> once you, <laughs> once the heretic is on your side, you have nothing else to worry about, but, but those words are, are powerful. I mean, I've, I think I've been in that position myself where I've been in relationships before where it wasn't ideal, but it was because of, I thought, well, that's the most love I deserve. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, who hasn't, man? Like you look back at most of the bad decisions you've made in your life and you're like, well, it's because I didn't think that I was worth more. So I didn't stand up for myself with X, Y, or Z. That's exactly yeah. right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Your, your great grandfather owned a cake shop. Your grandfather owned a pizzeria and you just bought 850 pounds mm -hmm. of grain one day. Talk to us about <laughs> Your second passion, which is not buying 850 pounds of grain, but, but a, a baking. How did you get into this? How did you get into this? Why is this uh, such oh, so big man. in your life? Yeah, no, I've lost my mind. Um, I'm an artist at the end of the day. And I've always been an artist and I've always had a lot of, of talent. Um, I have always been a very, very good cook and uh, not to be, bragging at all. Um, no, but of course I not. <laughs> a, no, but I have a, a really intense palate. I'm a super taster is what they call it. So I can taste things that other people can't necessarily. Oh, and wow. I actually, um, one of the things I studied 
in college was wine science. So there was a small period in my life where I was like, Oh, I'll be a winemaker. And this or that, um, until I realized that I couldn't be an actor and a winemaker that would literally take over my life. Um, so I, I dropped that same with photography. I was a photographer for a while. I actually even did wedding photos and that sort of stuff. Um, so I've had a lot of <clears throat> creative interest in my life, but food has always been a minor passion for me. Um, and I've even said before, I was like, ah, oh, I would never do food for a living because it's too personal. Like when people don't like my acting, I can, I can slough it off and be like, all right, well, whatever. But if people don't like my food, I would take it personally. Like I, I couldn't put it out there because that's like love for me. It's my love language. Um, then I went through enough stuff with acting and with people hating me on the internet and had to get just super tough about it and really not care. And it helped that translate into my food to where I was like, huh, you know what? I could put this out there. And if people didn't like it, it'd be okay. Like it's not, it's not for them. Um, I love to create. Love, love, love to create. I have always loved baking and food. And when COVID happened, I was already a bread maker, um, among other things. I like, I like doing a lot of things. Um, but the thing that I had done with my mom growing up was we would bake bread together. She would mill wheat and we would bake bread together. When COVID happened, I started baking her bread for my family because it was this really nice way to keep her memory alive. Mm-hmm. And then I got kind of, I love a challenge, Chris. I just love anything that's hard. So I got kind of obsessed with the science behind natural fermentations and sourdough. I told you I was a nerd. <laughs> uh, and I was like, ooh. I wonder how far I could push this. I wonder if I could naturally like create all these organic cultures and naturally do a bread that takes five days to make. And I mean, (laughs) I nerded out hard because I needed to create something. There weren't characters that I was working on at the time because the industry was shut down and I have to create. It's who I am. So I started creating these really elaborate, crazy breads. And then it's just kind of taken over my life and spiraled and, now I have a second business. <laughs> I love it. Are, are people that own bread makers cheating? Oh, that, no. I mean, that would be like saying that owning a microwave is cheating. You do you. Isn't what? it, though? <laughs> hey, hey, if that is still better than store-bought, if that's, what you're, if that's what makes you happy at the end of the day, I say go for it. But, <laughs> you know, it's. It's whatever. <laughs> I, I love it. Where can we get, like, if we wanted to buy and, like, support your your oh. your baking, uh, wh- how would we do that? So for those of you listening, I really am insane. I started a bread speakeasy. Um, <laughs> it's called Lovey Bakehouse, and literally we don't have a storefront. The way that you do it is every week online I announce my bake, which is what days my bread can be picked up, and people – Order it online through my website. And then there, my brother owns a chain of bakeries that do donuts called Five Daughters Bakeries. And on my bake days, you can go up to the counter and you give them your name and they will slip you your bread bag. Like, I mean, it's literally like I'm, I'm selling bread drugs oh, <laughs> I lo- I love their, this. using their storefront. It's weird. It's another one of those strange intuition things where I can't even say that I planned this. It literally just came to me one day while I was running because people kept trying to buy my bread and I didn't have a system. And I was like, huh. I'm going to do bread speakeasy and that's what it's become. So yeah, you could go to our website. It's la V L A V I E bakehouse.com and read all about my process, what I do with the wheat. Cause I do mill all my own grains. Actually, there was this one grain my mother was obsessed with, um, growing up, which I always thought was weird, but she was like, no, it tastes different than the other ones. She's right. It does. And it's the only, form of grain that I make sure is in every single one of my bread. So it's like a little bit of her heritage is going into each loaf that I do. Um, yeah. And you order online for my bake days and then you secret pick it up and post pictures on the gram. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you what, uh, you sold me and I will be buying some bread very soon. (laughs) I will come in very, I will, I will come into five daughters with a trench coat on. Um, (laughs) <laughs> and and a top hat and I will look very mysterious and I will get my bread fix. Oh. Uh, thanks. Thanks to you. And you're, you're just uh, awesome creativity. Uh, so Valerie Jane, tell us where we can find you on social media and on the internet. Sure. Um, ooh, but if I do that, then that ruins the mystery. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, on 
Instagram guys, it's so hard to find me. I mean, my name is really secretive. It's, it's Valerie Jane Parker. Uh, same on Facebook. It's, it's really hard to find me. I'm, I'm Valerie Jane Parker. <laughs> but uh, it's simple. <laughs> uh, my website is also ValerieJaneParker.com. So I, I, make it, I make it a hard thing to do to, to track me down. <laughs> and how lucky are you just to get your name? We, you know, we have to be underscore bonsai creative. And oh. I think I may have told the story only one other time, but it's, it's because there's this sweet, lovely gentleman in London who has a marketing firm named bonsai creative and he owns all the bonsai creatives without the underscore. Yeah. And, and we asked to buy it from him and he was like, uh, well, mate, I've had this for, you know, like 20 or 30 years. I, I think I'm going to hold on to it. But good, but he was very sweet in his letter back to me. He's like, but best of luck. And I was like, That's okay. So we're underscore Bonsai Creative because of this this wonderful. And he's it's he's not like a big firm, Valerie. It's just this guy. He owns this company, and he's been doing sort of freelance marketing and branding consulting for for decades. And so here you are, being the first Valerie Jane Parker on the internet. Congratulations to you on that. Yeah. Take that other Valerie Jane Parkers. <laughs> it's really true. We, um, Sarah Zanotti's an actor in town in, in Nashville. She's super talented. She's going to have two films come out, uh, in the next probably six months. And there's another unbelievable, like they're like, it's an odd name, Zanotti. It's just not odd, but it's, it's not, you know, yeah, no, that's common. Neat. It's, it's not Smith. Or, or Parker, for that matter, right? So it's wow. there's another Sarah Zanotti, and not only is there another Sarah Z- Zanotti, there's another one in the same town. What? And not only is she in the same town, she kind of looks like her. No, it's very, true. very odd. And um, I would kill her. That's that's like your evil twin, or ooh, or maybe the one you interviewed is the evil one. Do you know? Do you know who's the real one? Well, if you heard Sarah Zanotti talk, you would probably say she was the evil one. Yes, no, but. No. But she's very funny and she has, she has talked about in a joking way, just in case this actually happens, she has <laughs> talked about killing the other Sarah Zanotti. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. Oh gosh. Uh, final question for you. You once uh, posted on social media that if you could be anything else, what would you be? You said, I'll go first. I'll be cheese. Yeah. Uh, what was that about? And then second, if you had to answer it, honestly, if you weren't an actor, what else would you be? Oh man, if I wasn't an actor, I would still be a weirdo. Uh, (laughs) No, if I, oh man, I used to say that I wanted to be Michael Caine when I grew up. So if I can't be cheese, I guess I'll be Michael Caine. Um, (laughs) who wouldn't want to be cheese? Cheese is delicious. It makes you happy. It goes with everything. Um, (laughs) <laughs> so that was, yeah, that was what that was about. I think that that was an honest answer. Um, if I wasn't an actor, I would still be a creative and I would want to be doing anything that made other people feel seen and loved. So I'm not really sure what that would be. Maybe it'd be a baker like I am right now. Maybe it would be a teacher. Maybe it would be something else, but yeah. <laughs> I love it. Valerie Jane Parker, I appreciate you so much. I hope to see you soon. I hope you're doing well. I know it's been a weird year. It looks like we have some light at the end of the tunnel. And hopefully if we can get together soon, I'd love to go back to breakfast with you or or, uh, have coffee or whatever. Yeah, that sounds great. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So you're in Atlanta right now or where are you right now? You're in Nashville? Good. That makes it very easy, doesn't it? (laughs) Yes. Yes. (laughs) Thank you so much. It's been Uh, wonderful. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's a delight, Paul. Anytime. Talk soon. All right. Sounds good. All right. Bye. You've been listening to the Make It Podcast. To find more information about this week's topics, including links to relevant blog posts, projects, and indie creatives, please visit our website at www.bonsai.film. If you haven't already, you can join our podcast community on Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice by searching for Make It Bonsai Creative and the show will pop right up. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Bonsai Creative and Facebook by searching for Bonsai Creative. And of course, if you're looking to take a big step towards your filmmaking success, go to www.bonsai.film and click on Book Us to schedule a free discovery meeting and needs assessment. You have everything to gain. Until next time, be better, 
be creative, be engaged, and thank you for listening.